I pray that the word of God will be still in every heart and will bring a change in every life. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'll be reading from the book of Psalm 35. I'll be starting from verse 37. That's that verse 27. Please let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. He said, Yea, let them say continually, Let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. If you are not convinced of any other thing, you need to be convinced that God wants you to thrive. The Bible says that let the Lord be magnified who hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. So when you prosper, when you thrive, God is happy. You know some people, they are the only ones that want to succeed. They don't intend any other person to succeed. Sometimes when they give you the opportunities, they only want you to succeed a little bit. They don't want you to succeed as much as they succeed. So when your success is getting to a certain level, they get angry that you are succeeding. Sometimes it happens in our offices. You know, the boss feels that, you know what, we are going to change the way we pay you. So we are going to start paying you based on the commission. Based on how many clients you are able to bring. Based on how much work you are able to produce. And so they put you on a marketing salary. How many people do they do that to? It's very common, they do it a lot. But the assumption is that you will not make as much as a certain level. So per chance, when the commission starts rolling in, and eventually rather than you fail, you begin to thrive. And probably he was paying you a hundred thousand naira, and your commission is now one million naira. <laughs> then you will know that such a person is not magnified like God and he really does not have the desire for you to earn much. Because that is when you begin to see all kinds of techniques of subtraction. <laughs> they will begin to say, now, you use the car, the pool car. <laughs> Who has been foiling the pool car? The office. The office. So, we will begin to subtract the money for the fuel from your pay. Assuming you say it's all right, no problem. By the second month, your commission is now two million naira. Now he will say that there's a driver that is always taking you around. <laughs> you will subtract his salary. And he says, okay. The next month, your commission increases. Then they will now say, that pool car that you are using, no other person in the office has been using it. So we are going to prorate it in such a way that we will sell it to you. <laughs> so they will not stop until they cut your salary, your pay, to the exact place they want it to be. But that is not my father. Yeah. The Bible says that let the Lord be magnified. His magnification is in your prosperity. God is not someone that he just wants you to prosper a little bit. He wants you to flourish. And as the theme of this your month of June is, he wants you to thrive. God is not interested in his children when they beg for bread. You know, one of the disheartening things these days that I see every morning when I go around 
You know when Ambode, the governor, the last governor, started building those bus stops? We were happy. But do you realize that any day this month, this, this, when you pass through the places, you see homeless people sleeping there. So rather than the purpose it, it was supposed to serve, some people are beginning to hijack it. Do you know that there are homeless people in America? Yeah, sure. Are you sure? Do you know? Yes. 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 Nigerians think that they pick money on the streets of America. They think that once you land in America like this, <laughs> that's all. I see all kinds of things that people do to be able to get to America. Now, where are they going? Canada, Australia. So they think that once you land in Australia like this, you have arrived, then the money keeps rolling in. Keeps rolling in. My brother, there are homeless people in America, even in Washington, D.C. When, we, when I went to do my post I went with a colleague. And the day we went out in the evening, and we went to the bus stop, and we saw some people sleeping there. You know? Not African descent, black man like me and you, but Oyibo sleeping in the bus stop. Some people believe that once you have that white skin, then you are made for life. You need to go there and see a lot of people with white skin that they are just suffering. They are not thriving. I want you to know that anywhere that God plants you is the place for you to thrive. Hallelujah. I have not said that you shouldn't change location if God asks you to. But what I've said is that don't block your mind and believe that the only place you can thrive is outside this country. Because God wants nations to thrive. In the book of Psalm 122, verse 6 to 7, the Bible says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. God wants us as a nation to prosper. God does not want Nigeria to be the dustbin of the world. He doesn't intend that we will be the failure of the generations. What God desires for Nigeria is that Nigeria will thrive. As a country of people, as an economy, in anything that we lay our hands upon, it is the desire of God for us to thrive. Moreover, his children. The Bible says that he has a desire. He's magnified and is happy when his servants, when his children prosper. So tell your neighbor, God wants you to prosper. God wants you to thrive. Tell him. In the book of Matthew 16, 18, the Bible says, And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I put it also to you that God wants churches to thrive. It is never the desire of God that he will start up a vision and the vision will die. God has a strong desire that when his church is moving on, even the gates of hell will not prevail against it. When you look at our nation, there is an attack on the church of God. Physically, spiritually, from within and from without. One of the ways, if you are in any of the social media groups that you can get people to start talking is by you telling them some rubbish and nonsense that your pastor has done. When you start that discussion, you will find out that there will be so many people that will start talking. Because there is an attack on the church of God. The devil wants us to be the laughing stock. 
but God wants us to try. God wants us to grow despite all these things, despite all the attacks of the enemy. The desire of God for you as a church is to thrive, is to grow. In the book of Isaiah chapter 66, verse 8, it says, Who has had such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth. What God wants for you is that when you travail, you will bring forth. It is not the desire of God for you that you walk and you struggle and you fight and you travail. He didn't promise you that there will be no travails. But his divine desire for you is that when you travail, you bring forth. Now, when you go to school, you come out with your degree. Not that they kick you out through road one. They, that we used to call it road one when I was in school. Because in my school, I went to Ife, and there's a very long and big, I think it's about six lane road that leads from the gate straight into the campus. So that's road one. So when they show you road one, it means that they are asking you to leave the school. Of course, for many reasons. So God wants us to thrive. He wants us to get rewards for our labor. But it is not everybody that thrives. There are three anomalies of thriving. Number one is what the medicals will call failure to thrive. And that is often spoken about children who are not getting adequate nutrients. So they are not growing as they use as they are supposed to grow. You know, children at the age of six weeks are supposed to be able to control their neck. Okay. How many mothers are in the house? Let me see your hand. If you are, a <laughs> are you a mother? Right? I know the baby. You know the baby. You breastfed. Okay. So there are certain, we call them developmental milestones. And it is the same thing for you as a man. You know, one of the painful things for me in this generation is that there are so many people in our country, so many adults that fail to thrive. There are some 30 year olds that are still living in their father's houses. That is a failure to drive. If you are 18, as a Caucasian, your father will kick you out of the house. Now, I'm not saying that that is the right age to kick people out of the house. But I'm saying that when a man is 40 years old and he's still living in his father's house, there's a problem. There's a problem. Some people will even go ahead to get married and have children and they are living in their father's I'm not saying it is a um, for, what do they call it? Maybe you have many flats and your father is staying the top flat you are staying in. No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying that you are living in the same house. The same four bedroom flat. At the age of 40, you are married, your wife is there. Your children, first, second, and third, you are living there. Grandma is living in the next room with grandpa there, and you are there. You will be surprised at the number of people in this country who fail to try. Unfortunately, we have been declared as the headquarters of poverty. And our president says he wants to get 100 million people out of poverty in 10 years. Well, maybe he's the first person that has spoken about it. But what will happen? In, what do you mean 10 years? Some of them will be dead. Some of them will be dead. So when they are dead, how is he going to get them out of poverty? 
But at least we know that he has said something. Is that the P of the president that switched off before? The microphone? <laughs> 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 is, there, is there an SSS person here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Eh? The president has sent his PA to switch off my microphone. <laughs> eh? Hallelujah. Okay. Okay. He wasn't the president. <laughs> Failure to try. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, 12 to 13, it says, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one will teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Unfortunately, there are still so many babes in Christ. Who though they've given their life to Christ for years, when they are supposed to be teachers, you are still finding people to chase them, people to look for them. Say, if you don't call me, I won't come to church. If nobody says hello to you during the week, then for that reason, you won't come to church. You are not thriving. Number two is the inability to deliver. You know the Bible talks about the day of adversity. And that day of adversity refers actually to not directly what I'm saying now, but to a time when your faith is tested. But for everyone, at every point in time, you are going to have adversity. If they've told you that when you are in Christ, you will not get adversity, let me correct that. Adversity will still come. And sometimes the adversity you will get may actually be much, much more than what you were getting when you were an unbeliever. But what we know is that in the adversity, God is with you. That even when you pass through the waters, they shall not overflow you. That's what the Bible says to us in the book of Isaiah 3. So there are some people, like Proverbs 24, 10 says that if you faint on the day of adversity, your strength is small. There are some people who, because of adversity, they fail. But the reason they fail to try is because their strength is small. Sometimes some will lack the ability to stay. What my people will call the staying power. Now in the book of... Second Samuel, the Bible spoke about David, chapter 3. It says, Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But the house of David waxed stronger and stronger. And the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. Once you declare for the Lord, just believe that this is your story. Because there will be a long battle till the day you go to meet your Lord Jesus Christ, the devil will not leave you alone. So you have, went, you have actually declared war against him. But in the name of Jesus, you will continually work stronger and stronger in Jesus' name. Amen. While the adversity will wax weaker and weaker. So some people are just merely surviving. They are not thriving. They are merely just finished. And there's nothing that you can run on. Don't get into that. You will not thrive. But when you know that the resources are available, there are things that people have not known. There are places that nobody knows of. There are resources that no one has put their hands on in this app. During the other night, I was giving an example about the, the, the mysterious things on this earth. Have you ever asked, where did God get enough water to feed four million people for 40 years in the wilderness? Water. Go and try it. We say there's shortage of water in Nigeria. But God himself gave water to about four million people for a period of how many years in the wilderness continuously? just from a rock, because he tapped from the depths of the earth. So what that means to me is that there's water somewhere. There are some 
precious ideas that are yet to be unleashed on this world. There are some precious things that can change the life of people that we have not yet heard about. Recently I went for a conference somewhere in East Europe and they were telling us about artificial intelligence. They are asking the question, if data is the new oil? And you'll be surprised at the kind of information that is available and the excellence at which some of these artificial intelligence systems are dealing with human issues. Ladies and gentlemen, the exhaustion of oil is an advantage and not a disadvantage. People have been continuously focused on the wrong thing. There are still opportunities in this world. You know there are some businesses that if you tap into it, it will seem as if you are a sugar ant that they suddenly dropped in a big bowl of sugar. You will eat yourself, you will prosper in so much a way that you cannot imagine. Don't forget God desires that you should prosper. Anyone that says that because you serve God, in fact, the Bible says that a righteous man shall leave an inheritance for his children and his children's children. If what you are eating is not enough for you, how will you leave an inheritance for your children? You will even chop everything. You know, some of my Yoruba people will say, come on to Jogun, Moti Do you know what that means? <laughs> it means that before my child may inherit anything, I have finished it. You know why you can have that mentality? Because what you have is not much. That just is what, all you have is just what is under your pillow. But assuming that your bands have expanded, you can't finish it in your generation. Assuming that you suddenly get your hands into a new mechanical system that controls the satellites and then they are able to give unto you the patent for that you will eat it for the next 10 generations you understand me by the time the patent starts warming up it will be your third generation daniel it will not even be this generation because what they will first of all give you will be the the icing on top of the cake. It is your children's children that will start eating the cake. There are some things, there are some values that are still on this earth. There are businesses that hands have not touched. There are greatness that man has not seen. That God will lay in your hearts in the name of Jesus. Amen. So don't let anybody tell you that all the resources on this earth are finished. It's a lie. Not true. There are so many resources. There are so many things you have not imagined, never. You've not even thought about it. And God will bring them into your heart in the name of Jesus. Amen. You are not thriving when you see failure as the end results of things gone wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you. Everybody one time in life failed. Every one of us once in life failed. You know, I was sharing with my son that when I was in school, all through the years, I was always the one that came first in class, in secondary school. So the first year that I... <coughs> Now I came second in my class, and that was the only time for the whole duration. I cried all the way from school home. And when I got home, everybody was asking me, why are you crying? I couldn't tell them, because my grades were very good. My grades were excellent. He only beat me by a small margin. In fact, I still remember why he beat me. I remember the subject till today. 
and my grades were excellent. And everybody said, excellent. But it was so painful that there was somebody that could beat me in that class. That was secondary school. When I got to university, <laughs> I met some boys that God knows what their brain is made of. Some of them we will read the same material. I will spend three hours reading the material, they will spend one hour. They will go and play for the remaining two hours, make noise and disturb the whole school, do politics and come back and meet me when I'm still reading. And when we start asking questions, they will get everything. So I met, that's when I knew that, look, it is because you have not met anything that you think that is best. You will meet some people that are better than you are. Your competition is not with anybody but with yourself. Everybody has an advantage. The disadvantage of those of my, in fact, I was speaking with one of them yesterday. The disadvantage of those of my friends is that one year after, you ask them what they read, they don't remember. So they must always read towards the exam. If I read something today, in the next 25 years, ask me, I still remember it. Although I will take longer than average to assimilate it. So you understand yourself. Failure is a consequence of trial. A man that does not try, there's no pride in saying that I have never failed. It's no pride. It is probably because you have not tried enough. When you try enough, you will record a failure. But what will determine how far you go is your reaction to the failure. Don't develop a victim mentality that you will say, ah, now I have failed though. The world has ended. And they start crying, they start doing all kinds of things. Huh? Some people unfortunately even commit suicide because they fail. That should never be heard of in the house of God. Failure is something that will come all our ways for many reasons. Sometimes you are actually doing the wrong thing. And it is when you are hit by failure that it makes you think back. I think I've said this before. In school, med school, when I finished med school, I wanted to be a cardiologist. I spent a lot of time reading those stuff related to it. Then one day, you know, I just sat down and I asked myself, why am I wasting my time? My present specialty is a surgical specialty. How do I read it? In my house, on my bed, crossing my leg against the wall, reading the book and turning it around. I don't sit down, I don't do, I don't stress myself. I just ask myself, why will I go into a field where it takes me an extra effort to understand? And I have another field that I don't stress myself. Which one would I like to do all through my life? Stressing myself or just flowing naturally? There's something that will come to you naturally by the abilities that God has given you and that's what you should do. That's the direction to your driving. So some men, they don't know the difference between blue, between lilac and purple. They don't know the difference. So and then you don't want to be a fashion designer or what you want to be. You don't know the details. But that's why you want to break your head. <laughs> or whenever they mention, you know, I had some friends in school there, whenever they mention mathematics, they start crying. <laughs> Especially some ladies. And they say, ah, we are having a test tomorrow, and the test is mathematics. Ah, they just start crying. So why would such a person insist on doing engineering? Mm -hmm. Why? Whereas there's a field that when you mention it to them, they are so happy. In fact, they want the exams to come because they know that they will do well. Your thriving lies in the area of your natural strength. The area where God has endowed you. 
to be naturally good. There's nobody that is absolutely bad at everything. If you think so, it's because you have not seen where you are good at. May the Lord lead you in such paths in the name of Jesus. Amen. Failure is not the end. It's not the end. If you want to try it, you must learn how to handle failure. In life, I will just tell you about three things that are enemies to thriving. I've mentioned some. I've mentioned the three more. I've mentioned the victim's mentality. And of course, you can see that in the scripture. After Elijah has had that success, and the woman, Jezebel, came against him, he developed a victim's mentality. He said, that I only, I'm the only one left. They have killed all the others. And even me, they seek my life. God, come and take it yourself. Because he developed a victim's mentality. Now, there's a particular mentality that I, I call fine boy mentality. <laughs> fine boy mentality. Now, let me explain to you. There's only a limit where your beauty and your physical attraction can take you to. Assuming you are going for an interview and they are looking for the top, let's say you are a lawyer and you are going for an interview, the last interview where they want to give you the senior advocate of Nigeria. And your preoccupation is on your looks. You spend your time making your hair, yeah, making sure you are made. Rather than going to study all the cases that they are going to ask you, in the panel. So when you get there, you look nice. But when they ask you the question, you don't know anything. Some people spend their time on the wrong thing. Especially professionally. They spend the majority of their life doing the wrong thing in their profession. They master the wrong thing that has no consequence. And as such, when promotion comes, some things are not taken into consideration. Number three is ignorance. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. For he that keepeth the law, happy is he. When you are completely ignorant, you can have the natural predisposition. Mm -hmm. You can have the natu natural predisposition for anything. But even though you have the natural predisposition, you need to develop it if you want to try. You need to inform yourself. One of the greatest errors of small businesses in Nigeria is that people who get involved in those small businesses know little about the businesses. They know literally about the technical part of the business. For instance, you are a marketer. They've asked you to market an engineering software that is capable of calculating with a single punch of the button the immediate depth you are working with Shell of um, the place where they will drill in order to heat oil. And you want to go and market that software to them. But you don't know anything about it. When you get to the interview, you will be speaking with people who have PhD in that field. And by the time they finish with you, you will regret that you came to market anything. So you must learn to improve yourself. Now, many of you will not be making, you will not be making a livelihood from what you studied in school. So, open your eyes to the opportunities in life. God will bring so many of them across your way. 
So whenever you discover something that is a flair for you, you need to inform yourself about it. You need to inform yourself about it. And then, the Lord will make way for you. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So how can you try? Number one, create the atmosphere to try. You will think that the responsibility to creating that atmosphere lies solely in the hands of God. Not really. He has actually given you what you need. So the remaining for you is to get the right atmosphere set. Now you see, sometimes we see a lot of people, for instance, you go out, you say, wow. You say, bold. He just ran 100 meters in, in sub-9 seconds. Wow, fantastic. But you don't know what he went through to be able to get it done. There's this base jumper, Felix Corunda, who jumped from a helium balloon 24 miles above the air to set the record as the highest ever free fall. You know, he jumped, they took the helium balloon very high. He jumped and he had a free fall. I said, everybody said, wow. But if you know the preparation that it took, you will not believe the team, of, the team of experts. Somebody to look at his biometric readings. Somebody to look at him. They went through underwater everywhere. They even got him a psychologist. Because after they have finished everything and it was fantastic, just in like two weeks to the time he was going to jump, he became afraid of his jumping suit. <laughs> so they had to get him a psychologist. Look at the women playing football. Do you think they don't know Nigerian women don't know how to play football? They can't. Many of them are very good, but I actually admire some of their skills. But you see, the preparation is inadequate. We are not looking at a holistic way of preparing people. Every team has a team psychologist. <laughs> Nobody goes to the World Cup without paying allowance. <laughs> so they will fight overnight on allowance. And then in the next match, you will expect them to perform miracles. They won't. They were supposed to be sleeping. In fact, as an athlete, they will so much monitor you that they will monitor what you are eating, how you are eating it, they will monitor your weight, they will monitor everything, how much fluid you should take. Yes. But we just think that it's the responsibility of God to create the atmosphere. We just, everything is God. We wait for God to wake up in the morning to get us out of the bed. If you create the right atmosphere, you will try. Because God has made you a victor. Number two. You need to get a scriptural feedback. Now, the Bible is so complete. It's so complete that the Bible calls it a mirror. Calls the word of God a mirror. It gives you who you are when you go into the world. You don't shake it off. It gives you a feedback about how you are performing. As we are talking now, the Word of God is giving a lot of people a feedback. You know, it's telling you that this is, the Holy Spirit is sitting beside you now. And when the point that hits you that is supposed to be your own gets, it will tell you that's your own. But you know, some people will say, ah, it's brother Tunde. I wish he was here to hear this message. No, it's for you. 
So you look at the world as a mirror, and you get a feedback. There was a young boy, 12 year old, he walked into a, 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 one of these shops in the US. He picked up the phone, dialed the number, and called. And the old woman on the other side, he said, ah, how are you, madam? Yeah, I would like to clean your lawn. I said, no, I already have somebody cleaning my lawn. He said, I would do it for half the price that he's cleaning the lawn. And the other woman said, no, 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 it's okay. I'm very happy with the boy cleaning my lawn. I am okay with how much he's charging me. I don't need to change him. He dropped the phone, he was happy, and he was walking out. And so the owner of the, of the store called him and said, why? Why are you happy? You just you were just refused a job, and you are so happy. He said, no, I'm the one cleaning the woman's lawn. I was only trying to find out from her how I was doing. So that's what the world does to you. It tells you exactly how you are performing. It gives you a feedback. It gives you a feedback. A very strong feedback. Sometimes the feedback of the world can be very, very strong. You know, it can be very, very rebuking that you will want to shut it out. Like the Bible talks about the fool. You know? Because of the Hebrew word that the fool is, when they translate it into English, a fool is a fool. That's what you think. But when you look at the Hebrew, there are actually five words that stand for the fool. Discover, discover, disloggard, and the central fool. So when we break it down, if you want to try it, you go, if you have a Bible, so you just look for sluggard. And you see sluggard. That's one category of fool. Then you see the slot fool. That's another category of fool. Then you see the sensual, the scorner. It's another category of fool. So the Bible actually classifies five fools. The simple fool is the one that just opens his mind to every passing thought. He opens his his arms to any passing stranger. In other words, he lacks discernment. A simple fool lacks discernment. He's dangerously immature, extremely gullible. Proverbs 22 3 says, A prudent man foreseeth evil and hideth himself. But the simple fool passes on and is punished for it. The silly fool often gets himself in trouble because of his mouth. Now, you may smile, but those first two fools, they are amenable to correction. The sensual fool is a worse one because he doesn't have any mental deficiency, but he rather rejects the wisdom of God purposely. The Bible talks about Balak and Balaam. How many people remember that story? So you don't really, how many numbers? 23, 19. So here was, was Balaam. Balaam in Numbers 23, he was describing himself. He says that I am Balaam the seer. The one that fallen down with his eyes open. What he means is that he's making the error. He's making a mistake. He knows he's making a mistake and he's continually making the mistake. Is he not the one that says that no one can curse Israel? <laughs> is he not the one that says that it is not possible to curse anything that God has blessed, but yet eventually <laughs> he did it? That is fooling. So if I had gone to Panama and called him a fool, he would have he would have not he would have refused. But according to the definition of the Bible is a sensual fool. It's a fool that knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing is wrong and he's still doing it. 
the worst of all of them is the steadfast fool. And the Bible in the book of uh, Psalm 14, verse 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Complete idiot. He has just decided, you know, <laughs> he says that there is no God. Ah! The Bible living by what they will call, they are just living from hand to mouth. They are just surviving. I will tell you some signs of people that, that are just surviving. Number one, they are more reactive than proactive. People that are just surviving, they are just, they are just simply reactive. They are not proactive. They just wait, the trouble comes to them and they react to the trouble. They wait that things are thrown at them, they just react to it. They are not the one that sets the pace of the things that go on. Pastor Alex wrote a book, he says that you are the prophet of your life. So if you want to thrive, you need to be in the driver's seat of your life. Don't put any other person there. Except the Holy Ghost. You should be in the driver's seat. You should not just be reacting to situations. You should be proactive about dealing with situations. Number two, people who are just surviving, they blame circumstances and others or find excuses when things go wrong. It's just the same thing. You are not in the driver's seat. You divulge your leadership, your driver's skill in your own life to another person. And when anything happens, you just give an excuse. You can never be good at any other thing once you are good at excuses. You can never be good at any other thing. Once you are excellent at making excuses for things, then you cannot be good at any other thing. So if you want to thrive, you must learn to know that when things go wrong or when things are not working the way you want them to work, you take responsibility for it. People blame everybody for everything. Whereas the person you should blame is the man you see in the mirror. They say they are corrupt, they have done abominable works. There is none that do it good. He is steadfast, just steadfast in what he, he, he knows. These are feedbacks from the Word of God. When you look at the Word of God, and it, the Word classifies the activity that you are doing. Don't try to reclassify it. Hmm? They say it's fornication. And you say, no, it is not. You redefine it. <laughs> leaving girlfriend, leaving boyfriend. Uh, what other words do you use? Help me now. Which other words do you use for it? What, what the Bible says that it is fornication. There are so many things that the Bible just tells you, you know, straight off. <laughs> Somewhere we had a lot of discussion. Ah, I think I just told them, and a lot of people hated me from it, for it. I just told them straight. God hates divorce. Full stop. They said no. You have to analyze it very well. Because According to, you know, God doesn't, he does, yes, he hates divorce, but he doesn't hate the divorcee. Yes, he doesn't. But did he ask you to do it? Then they turn it around and analyze it. Or some people in business, you know, they are stealing. Stealing is stealing. They give it all kinds of names. Professional gratification. <laughs> PR. And it's just PR. Just 
there. So when the word gives you a feedback about exactly what is going on, take it. That is the only way you can thrive. If you go around predefining what the word has said, you are not going to thrive. When the word says something, you look in the mirror of the word, it tells you this is what, this is the situation. Don't redefine it. So this morning we are going to pray. And we're going to ask God to step into our lives, remove everything that has been an impediment for us to try. We ask that God will release into our lives a newness of life. Because as we have read, the Bible says that let the Lord be magnified who has a desire in the prosperity of his servant. If you have been just surviving, just living from hand to mouth, God is going to change that today in the name of Jesus. He's going to bring your life to a portion, to a place where you will thrive according to the scriptures.